sorry, I explained the DVT, yes? The deep vein thrombosis and what it can cause, say yes. yes. What can a deep vein thrombosis cause? Can it cause a stroke? No. No, it causes a what? And if the pulmonary embolus is big enough, you die almost instantly. These people go into asystole like now. They're dead. And the best way to prevent a pulmonary embolus to not give one is that's why they ambulate you venous return because venous blood that doesn't move has a tendency to and because you don't always move your legs you get clots in your deep veins of your legs that's why it's called a deep vein thrombosis so essentially get up and walk around like I said <laughs> get up and walk around yeah or take a big deep breath or read the textbook that reduces DVT by 27.6 percent hmm, you laugh go ahead okay we did good there all right uh, let's do uh, okay let's do um, number 11 don't give me that look that wasn't a, even a look it was a sound Um, in clinical, do they talk to you about uh, end systolic and end diastolic volume, stroke volume, ejection fraction? Do you have to know about that? You got to know about it, but they don't talk to you about it. Oh, well, good. So you'll get that wrong. But I don't think any of us have done clinicals in cardiac Oh, you, you haven't done that yet? No. How many people in health alterations, don't you have to give a presentation like on on congestive heart failure or something like that? Don't they make you do that? No. Well, I saw a bunch of presentations with a mind map on congestive heart failure. I'm going over congestive heart failure. Did you look at the, yeah, the concept map, yeah. You guys do that? I tried. It didn't work. I got to tell you, that's another, that's a, that's a great way of, Getting out of teaching a class. Did you do it on congestive heart failure? You have to pick what you want. Well, did you pick congestive heart failure? Oh, that. You know what I tell people who are depressed? Snap out of it. I pick depression. Okay, here we go. Watch. Watch. This always reminds me of a Christmas video for some reason. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Th Look, no, I'm doing number eleven. Define cardiac output. You with me? Watch. Watch. Who's watching? Okay. Which side of the heart pumps more blood, the right or the left? They you've been tricked. Okay, watch. Do you pump all 5,000 cc's at once? Instantly. Do you? No. If you did, you would have to have a left ventricle like this big. Then it would contract and you like. <laughs> and then at the end of you like. So the heart pumps a little bit of that blood over the entire minute. So watch. When you feel your pulse, that's actually the left ventricle contracting and pushing blood through your systemic arteries. We know this, yes? And it's measured as a heart rate. Say yes. That's actually, incidentally, it's the number of times the SA node fires in a normal functioning heart. <laughs> okay, so watch. How many times does the normal heart beat each minute? Right, so we're going to say 70, because that's an average. 
70 beats per minute. You got me? How much blood does it eject with each beat of the heart? Yes, it pumps out 70 cc's per beat. So if you multiply 70 cc's per beat times 70 beats per minute, you get 4,900 cc's per minute or approximately 5,000 cc's per minute. Say yes. Now watch. The amount of blood ejected with each beat of the left ventricle is called your stroke volume. So to determine cardiac output, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Now, how does venous blood get back to your heart if there is no pressure in the veins? And? That's right. So watch. If you start running <laughs> and you start contract, contracting more muscle, what happens to venous return to the right side of the heart? It goes up. So what happens to the stretch of the right side of the heart? It goes up. So what happens to the force of contraction? The stroke volume, the amount of blood ejected with each beat, and the pressure of that blood ejected to the lungs. Up, up, up. up, up. And we learn that the amount of blood pumped out of the right heart is equal to the amount of blood pumped out of the left heart. So if there's more blood in the right heart, there's going to be more blood in the... Yes. And the left heart's going to stretch, force of contraction's going to go up, and what's going to happen to the pressure of that blood? Good, go up. Say yes. So when you are exercising, <laughs> what's happening to stroke volume? Higher. What's happening? Going up. Going, good, it's going up. Is exercise stressful? Yes. Yes, it's bad for you. <laughs> Sit on the chair. So what's happening to your sympathetic nervous system? So what happens to your heart rate? So if your heart rate and your stroke volume go up, what happens to your cardiac output when you're exercising? <laughs> Tell me you got that. See how that works? OK. How many people know the circulation of blood through the heart? You know it. Like, if somebody, you somebody threatened your life if you couldn't explain the circulation of blood through the heart. Are you living or are you dying? You're living? Okay, good. Ready? Let's see. What's the valve that separates the pulmonary veins from the left atrium? No. <laughs> what? No. The pulmonary veins in the left atrium, quickly, there's four choices. No. Okay, we've gone through three. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're dying, guys. Yep, I guess we're all toast. I'm waiting. No. What's the valve that separates the pulmonary veins from the left atrium? What? I heard it. No. <laughs> there isn't one. You've been tricked! Oh. <laughs> You've been tricked! <laughs> the pulmonary vein, you, if you know the circulation of blood, the pulmonary veins take oxygenated blood from the lungs and bring it to the left atrium. Tell me you got that. So watch. You're evil. I ain't evil. <laughs> oh yeah, you want to fight? Okay, watch. Hang on. Look. Is this what I want? 
I don't think so. Hang on. Oh, yeah, wait. Look. I like this. You ever look at this and just kind of rock back and forth a little bit? Just make sure nobody's seeing you. All right, so watch. Right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonic valve, pulmonary trunk, left and right pulmonary arteries, say yeah. And what happens to the sides of the pulmonary vessels? They get deeper and deeper into the lungs. And they terminate at the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary where gas exchange occurs, right? So all the, the pulmonary venules come together at the pulmonary veins and dump that newly oxygenated blood into the left atrium. Say yes. So if the left side of the heart is failing, where is that blood going to back up into? The lungs. The lungs from where it came from. Say yes. So left-sided heart failure causes pulmonary edema. I'll explain that more in a minute. How many people got that? Okay. So let's look at this. You would think, okay, ooh, that's close. Oh, that reminds me of like, just like a summer, like a Christmas show when I was a kid. Okay. <laughs> Wait. Is this the highlighter? I don't want that. I don't want the pen. Okay, watch. How, what's it called when the amount of blood ejected with each beat of the left ventricle? No. Get out. Kick her out. <laughs> the amount of blood ejected with each beat of the left ventricle is called stroke volume. Who's with me? What's the average stroke volume in the adult heart at rest? 70 cc's per beat. Right? Now watch. Do you pump out all the blood that's in the left ventricle with each beat? No. no. So watch. There is a certain amount of blood in the left ventricle before it contracts. You're following me. What happens right before systole? You have to end diastole. So the end diastolic volume, which I'm not writing out. That's too long. It's three words. That's the amount of blood in the left ventricle before it contracts. Say yes. And the average amount of blood in a normal functioning left ventricle, on average, is about 110 cc's. You with me? How much blood... Of that 110 cc's is pumped out with each beat. 70. 70 cc's. So how much is left over? Well, 110 minus 70, zero. Got to carry the one. It's 11. So that's 40 cc's. So the end systolic volume is 40 cc's. Say yes. Now watch. When a doctor thinks that the, the muscular wall of the heart is not contracting very well, how you get that image is with an echocardiogram. So an echocardiogram is used to look at wall motion and volumes of the heart. Say yes. All right. So watch. So one of the things that they will measure is they look at the efficiency of that left ventricle. They want to see how hard that heart is contracting compared to how much blood is in there before it contracts. So they do what's called an ejection fraction. An ejection fraction looks at the efficiency of the heart. How much blood is in there to start with in a normal heart? 110 cc's, right? So that's the end <coughs> diastolic volume. And how much blood is ejected with each beat of the heart? 
70 cc's, right? So that's your stroke volume. So if you take your stroke volume divided by your end diastolic volume, that gives you an ejection fraction. And normal ejection fraction is between like 60 and 65%. So a normal left ventricle at rest should be pumping out 60 to 65% of the blood that's in there. Who's with me? Okay. So end systolic volume, end diastolic volume, ejection fraction, um, and I explained to you cardiac output. Tell me you got that. Now what I'm going to do is explain to you congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure is a syndrome, meaning many things can cause heart failure, right? So you're looking at common signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure. Who's with me? Now, it's because people don't know the circulation of blood through the heart. They don't know the difference between right-sided heart failure and left-sided heart failure. <coughs> you now know that wherever the blood came from, for that side of the heart, that's where the blood is gonna back up into. So in left-sided heart failure, the blood backs up into the lungs. In right-sided heart failure, it black, backs up into where? The body. the body. And because most people are upright during the day, depending on their profession, <laughs> the vast majority of that extra fluid is going to accumulate in their legs. That's why people with CHF get big, folded legs. Mm -hmm. Say yes. For most people have left sided failure, right? So right, but left side. Right okay. Left sided failure leads to right sided failure. Correct. And a partridge in a pear tree. How many people followed this? Okay, how many people here? are CNAs. How many people wish they weren't CNAs? Good. How many people want to be nurses where you can work the same amount of hours and make three times as much? Yeah, that's a good move. That's what I would do. So, so watch. Watch. The left ventricle is a muscle. <laughs> Are you with me? Okay, now watch. If you're a CNA and you're working on a floor and one of the other CNAs calls in sick because they're reading the textbook, you immediately know that's made up. What do you have to do? You have to work harder because the same amount of work has to get done. Say yes. Better write this down because I'm not. I'm just going to say it. The left ventricle works harder by stretching. Right. I could be like a pimp. <laughs> Play it. See, that's juxtaposition. An old bald-headed white guy trying to act gangster. I'm going to tell you something at the end of class. <laughs> it's got to wait till the end. Okay, so watch. Watch. This is a normal heart. You got me? Normal heart. If you add more blood back to it, what does it do? Stretch. It stretches. So you line up the actin and myosin so it contracts harder. Tell me you got that. Watch. Your left ventricle is damaged. Something happened to it. So the remaining working parts have to work harder. So how does the left ventricle work harder? By stretching. This is the important piece, so I'm going to take my time with this. In a person with congestive heart failure, at rest, this is as good as it gets. The alignment of actin and myosin when a person is at rest is at its optimal. It doesn't get any better than that. Please tell me you got that. You got that. So in people with congestive heart failure, what will happen over time is the left ventricle 
will actually dilate and thin out. So instead of the left ventricular chamber being this big, the left ventricular chamber now is this big. So they have what's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Oh, I'm Duke boys. I'm sorry, did I say hypertrophic? Well, okay, so I made a mistake. Right, and lucky I catch them most days. This is called a dilated cardiomyopathy. Why? The heart muscle, specifically the left ventricle, is stretched out. Say yes. Dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, if you have less heart muscle to work with, yep, if you got less heart muscle to work with, because somebody, one of your CNA buddies didn't show up, right? You have to work harder. Say yes. Do you have to do the same amount of work? Yes. Is it harder to do that work? Yes. Right. So in a person whose heart, left ventricle, is dilated, stretched out, do they still have to pump out 70 cc's per minute? Their stroke volume has to be 70 cc's. But the amount of blood that they start out with, is it more or less? It's more. So a person with dilated cardiomyopathy, watch it, their end diastolic volume is like 210 cc's. Are you with me? What's their stroke volume have to be because they got to maintain Q? So if you take and look at the efficiency of that heart, the ejection fraction, you take the stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume, and you have 70 cc's divided by 210 cc's. So you have an ejection fraction of 33%. And people with an ejection fraction less than 50% have heart failure. The lower the ejection fraction, the worse their heart failure is. Say yes. The lower the ejection fraction, the worse their heart failure is. You need to get this. Their left ventricle right here, good as it gets. It don't get any better than that. Tell me you got that. So a person with CHF, do you want Mr. McGillicuddy, hey Mr. McGillicuddy, run around the block a couple of times, okay? Do you want him to do that? Because if they start running, what happens to venous return to the right side of the heart? The right side of the heart is fine, no problem. It's going to stretch, the force of contraction is going to go up, and it's going to send more blood to the lungs. The left side of the heart now is going to take all that extra blood, but it's as good as it got. So when you add more blood back to that left side of the heart, you will overstretch it. So now it's got more blood in it, and it can't contract as hard. So what's going to happen to the amount of blood that ends up in the left ventricle? It's going to go up. And that blood that was in the left ventricle that can't get pumped out because the left ventricle is overstretched is going to back up into the left atrium. And what's the valve that separates the pulmonary veins from the left atrium? There isn't one. So that blood starts backing up into the pulmonary venules pulmonary capillaries, alveoli, and you get pulmonary edema. That's beautiful. You know that that is. Say yes. yes. So do you want someone with congestive heart failure doing a lot of activities? That's why in a nursing care plan, you space their activity. And 
right? What? You don't elevate their legs. You don't elevate their legs. Because you learned that there's no pressure of the veins, didn't you? That's why people with congestive heart failure, as it gets worse, they sleep more and more upright because they have to sequester by gravity that venous blood in their legs. Can I get an amen? amen? And if you understand, watch. You know why nurses have to write care plans? Because they don't understand pathophysiology. If you understand pathophysiology, you know exactly what to do for them. You sit them up when their breathing's labored. You watch their I and O, oh, ain't that right? People with CHF can't be drinking all kinds of water. If you work on a cardiac floor, the cardiologist comes in, where's my damn weight? I'm on my weight. Because people ain't going to be, when they're in the hospital and they're sick, they ain't going to be munching down, yeah, can I have another dinner tonight? <laughs> right? But they can gain three or four pounds of water weight. And in left-sided heart failure, where does the water go? That's why, watch, most people are upright based on their profession. So when you listen to somebody's lungs, where's the fluid going to build up first? In the bases of the lungs and will progressively move up. So the higher that fluid is, the worse their failure. Say so yeah. Then watch, watch. When it gets so bad, the fluid starts getting pushed into the larger airways and they start a gurgling. That's the death rattle. That's severe end stage, end of life, CHF. If you ever seen anyone like a nursing, they put them in that high fowler's position and they're suctioning them, right? Say yes. How many people followed that? Very important that you understand that's a dilated cardiomyopathy. And the most common cause of dilated cardiomyopathy is myocardial infarct, death of heart muscle, right? The CNA called in dead. Now you have to work harder. How does that heart work harder? By stretching. Say yes. Watch it. <clears throat> What's the most important element in muscular contraction? Do you have calcium channels in your heart? What? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <coughs> Do you have calcium channels in your heart muscle cells? Did you get together at break? <laughs> <laughs> who answered? Someone over there said, said something. Who, who said what? Throwing people under the bus. It was. <laughs> Do you have calcium channels in heart muscle cells? Right, that's exactly what you're supposed to say. Yeah, yeah. What's the most important element in muscular contraction? Can calcium channel blockers affect your heart rate? Yeah, yes, that's exactly how you're supposed to say it. Tell me you got that. Now watch, I'm going to tell you a story. This is a true story. And this taught me that if I don't know my stuff, I'm going to be killing people. And that gets stapled to all of your resumes. Yep, I'm an RN, but killed people. So I had a guy who had amyloid cardiomyopathy. His heart was turning to stone. That's a condition. His ejection fraction was 18%. So that left ventricle wasn't contracting so good. Say yeah. So all of a sudden he goes into a supraventricular tachycardia. Oh. With a rate of about 210. So his blood pressure drops because 
it doesn't give time the ventricle to fill with blood because it's beating so fast. So his blood pressure bottoms out. So I called, they had a cardiac fellow who was in charge of the ICU at night. So I call him up, dude, supraventricular tachycardia, 210, amyloid cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of 18%. He said, give him five milligrams of verapamil, ill, 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 IV push. I said, his ejection fraction is 18%. Give it to him. I said, I'm not giving it to him. I'm calling the attending. So I call the attending, and he says, give him 0.25 of dig. I said, I'll do that. Tell me you got that. Now, verapamil controls your heart rate. It slows it down. But it's a calcium channel blocker. What's the most important element in muscular contraction? Calcium. So if this heart is contracting like this, and I give him verapamil, his heart stops contracting, and he ends up dead. And then I have a new job. Do you want fries with that shake? And you think I'm joking, but I'm telling you right now, you make a mistake, they're, they'll find another nurse, they will put... Bam, bye. And I told you about my preceptor who gave the uh, patient, instead of giving them Lasix, gave them potassium. She was a waitress at uh, um, Olive Garden. Yeah? Uh, I see you. Okay. So when the doctor told you to give the medication and you did not give it, what was your next step? Of course you didn't give it. So Right, I called the attending. But did you report that doctor as well? Yeah, I told the attending. Yeah, here's my point. Watch. If you give a drug and it's the wrong drug, you in trouble too. Because you got a license. They said you're supposed to know better. See where I'm going with this? That doesn't scare you a little bit. Well, ignorance is bliss and Timmy cannot help you. Of course not. Right, okay. right. I'm not. You are an advocate for your patient. If you know it's wrong, you say I'm not giving it, and then go through the proper channels. But this is life or death. So I'm like, okay, buddy. I'm calling the attendant. And if the attendant would said, give him five milligrams of Rapamil, you wake woke him up. Okay, he's the doctor. But I knew that was wrong. But would you have given it if they No. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Tell me you filed this, guys. That's why you got to know what's going on. If you don't, then you know where you'll end up? Pizza Hut. And you know how they say, people who can't do teach. Just so you know, I did, right? And I did it, right? And now I gotta, I'm got i teaching. I don't even know why I'm doing that. But people who can't teach, teach gym. All right. <laughs> what? Oh, <laughs> is he? <laughs> you never saw. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> You never watched, uh, what was that show? With, uh, uh, forget it, who cares? Woody, Woody Allen? That's the line from there. Those who can't do, teach, and those who can't teach, teach Jim. You never heard that line before? None of my lines are original. That's sad. Okay. That's a bad thing. Movie quoting, that's a bad thing. I thought, I thought not being original. Women will never, ever get it. Well, some of them will, but... Yeah. Like the Forrest Gump when I knew. I knew that You know how I say I invented, like, AMP, like, eight year, years ago while I was eating supper? That's from Rocky. 
Yeah, the original Rocky Lake. Where did you come up with the Ita name Italian style? He goes, oh, I invented that eight years ago while I was eating dinner. <laughs> I shouldn't have told you, man. You thought I was actually original. Okay. That's right. I never read the textbook. All I did was watch movies. Okay. Okay, ready? Now watch. Watch. Do you want a lot of venous blood coming back to the right side of the heart if you have congestive heart failure? No. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. That was actually good. You got congestive heart, dilated congestive heart failure. Ooh. So one of the drugs that they're on and diuretics, ooh, ooh, they reduce preload. That's going to come back. I'm sure if you had health alterations, you preload, afterload, huh? They talk to you about that, don't they? Yeah? Well, now you're going to know. Not really. You'll forget this, but that's okay. <laughs> Pre you, so you want to reduce preload. And that's why weight is so important because you're not going to gain pounds eating hospital food. You're going to gain pounds retaining water. Say yes. Number two, you want to give them a arterial, um, you write that, arterial vasodilator. Now watch, your left ventricle is jacked up. You got me? It's jacked, it don't contract so good. So do you want your left ventricle having to push blood through arteries that are this big or arteries that are this big. So you give them vasodilate. What can dilate arteries? <coughs> calcium channel blockers. But do you want to give a person with congestive heart failure calcium channel blockers? No. That's why I covered that. <laughs> Do we know another thing that dilates arteries? It hit her really hard. <laughs> Go, just name off some of the chemicals we've talked about tonight. You'll hit it. Come on. What causes massive arterial vasoconstriction as a result of angiotensin converting enzyme? So do you want angiotensin 1 being converted to angiotensin 2 if your left ventricle is jacked up? That's very good. That's why people with a dilated congestive heart failure are on ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Say yes. And the most important effect of ACE inhibitors or ARBs is that they inhibit the effects of aldosterone. So what does that do to sodium? You pee it out. So what do you pee out along with it? Water. Say yes. So watch it. After load. That's determined by the diameter of the systemic arteries. So do you want after load to increase where the arteries get smaller or decrease where arteries get bigger if you have CHF? Do you want afterload to decrease, meaning the arteries got bigger if you have CHF, or increase afterload by making the arteries smaller? 
you want to decrease the afterload by making the arteries bigger. So in people with congestive heart failure, you want to decrease preload and decrease afterload. Preload is reduced by giving them diuretics. Afterload is, given, is reduced by dilating the arteries with typically an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Can I get an amen? Finally, what do you ultimately want to do with that heart? What do you want to make it do? Contract what? Contract blood? <laughs> do you want it to contract weaker or harder? So you want to give them, uh-oh. Oh. oh. Who's on there? <laughs> you have a new friend, Carrie Schaefer. That guy looks like a mass murderer. <laughs> Don't he? He's got a milk mustache. What the hell? <laughs> milk does body good. Yeah, I, I drink glass of milk after I slaughter people. <laughs> Will you be my friend? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Positive inotropic agent. What does inotrope mean? Don't give me that look. Huh? Who, who, who's talking? <laughs> who is it? Is it somebody back there? Who said force of contraction? Thanks. Say it loud. I'm deaf, like in 97 languages, right? <laughs> Po an inotrope posit is increased force of contraction. Do you want to increase the force of contraction in a heart that doesn't contract very good? Good. I'm glad. Yes. <laughs> good. So you give them digoxin. Are you ready? Watch. I want this whole thing. There's a video. Did you look at it? On the mechanism of action of digoxin. Did you look at it? Well, you should have. You know? What do you want from me? I'm trying hard for you. What do I get? Heartache. Here we go. Ooh, what was that? That was kind of scary. Ready? If you even remember one tenth of this stuff, you'll be you'll be far in ahead of other students. I guarantee it. You believe me? I'm just making that up. You have no advantage at all. <laughs> I just want money for this class. I don't care. Line my pockets. I laugh all the way to the bank. There's something new. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Ready? Watch. Where's sodium highly concentrated? Yeah, you knew that because I wrote an N there. Where's calcium highly concentrated? Ah, see, you caught on. You weren't even looking at the video. You're probably looking at your Facebook. Is she? Come on. Put her on blast. Is she updating her Facebook status with not paying attention? Can I tell everybody what you got on quiz number two or no? Me? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ready? Where's potassium highly concentrated? Okay, write this down. I'm not going to write it down. There's a law called the law of electroneutrality. Don't give me that look. <laughs> that does kind of sound made up, doesn't it? It's not. The law of electroneutrality states 
that the number of positively charged particles in the blood has to be equal to the number of negatively charged particles. So that the overall charge in the blood is neutral. And that the number of positively charged particles in the cell has to be equal to the number of negatively charged particles. So the overall charge in the cell is neutral. Now watch. There can be different amounts of part of, uh, positively charged particles and negatively charged particles. Are you following? So you can actually have a difference in charge across the cell membrane. But in the compartments, you have to have that law of electron neutrality. Are you following me? OK, so watch. We know the sodium potassium pump, don't we? And that it has two seats for potassium and how many seats for sodium? Okay. Three. And it pumps out three sodiums, and it pumps in two potassiums. And that requires ATP. Say yes, TP. All right? Now watch. Sodium is leaking in. Potassium is leaking out. Say yes. OK. Now. There's a drug called digoxin. And what digoxin does is it inhibits the sodium potassium pump by competing, D is for digoxin, with potassium for the seats on the sodium potassium pump. Tell me you're following this. So if digoxin binds there and potassium doesn't, the pump doesn't work. Tell me you got that. If digoxin binds to the sodium potassium pump on these heart muscle cells, who's with me? No, it'll do it on other cells, but primarily the heart. Watch. If it binds there, the sodium potassium pump doesn't work. Who's got me? Who's with me? But sodium leaks, continues to leak in. And if it's not pumped out, what's going to follow the sodium by osmosis? So the cells are going to blow up and, oh, you've got a problem. So in heart muscle cells, because sodium's building up, there is a exchanger that's activated when the pump is inhibited. It's called the sodium calcium exchanger. And the sodium is exchanged for the calcium in the blood. How many people are with me? And what's the most important element in muscular contraction? Calcium. So if there's more calcium in the heart muscle cell, what happens to how hard it contracts? So if it contracts harder, what does that mean in terms of the amount of blood ejected with each beat? It goes up. So the efficiency of the heart becomes stronger. Say yes. Now watch. Watch it. Watch it. I will be willing to bet anyone at least a dollar, maybe a dollar twenty-two. If you don't get this question at some time in your little nursing career, then I will give you a dollar, maybe a dollar twenty-two. Okay, watch. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Digoxin, potassium. They compete. They will actually bump into each other. Sometimes it gets a little violent. <laughs> now watch. If your potassium level is elevated, more potassium will bind there. 
So what will happen to the effectiveness of digitalis? It will go down. So hyperkalemia inhibits the effectiveness of digitalis. That's why you're told in your little nursery books, monitor the potassium level in people when they're given digital, aren't you? Nobody explained to you why, did they? Timmy did today. This is top flight info. You know it is, right, Jody? Yeah. Watch. That's why digitalis is given in the morning, because when do you get your most recent potassium? In the AM labs. <laughs> If your potassium level is low, that increases the digitalis effectiveness and can lead to digitalis toxicity. <laughs> Say yes. Now watch, watch. I'm going to teach you something that you probably didn't know. Have you ever heard of the term digitalization? Digitalizing a patient. Yep. Put a little KY. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to get coughed on. When somebody is starting on, started on digitalis, you have to give them a loading dose. Do you understand that? So it is a markedly high dose. Now watch, I'm making this up. I'm making it up. You need a hundred micrograms of digitalis in your blood. That's not even good. Nanograms, right? I don't know if nana, what is that? Nana. 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 <laughs> Nanograms. It's a small number. You got me? So watch, when you first start digitalizing, right? When you start lanoxonizing a patient for the first time, you give them a very high dose. Tell me you got that. Because they don't have any digitalis digoxin in their blood. Tell me you got that. But about 10% of that digitalis is excreted in the urine. So how much remains in the blood? If 10% of it's gone, I made it 100, so that's good. But the therapeutic dose of digitalis is 100. So that's why after they are appropriately digitalized, they're then given a maintenance dose. How much do they lose every day? 10. So instead of giving them 100 micrograms a day, you only give them 10 micrograms to maintain that digitalis level. <laughs> Say yes. Did anybody explain that to you? I guarantee you that they didn't. That's why you're like, well, this is a really high dose for digoxin. But if they're getting it for the first time, you got to kind of prime their system. That's why you do it. And know this, the therapeutic dose and the toxic dose for digitalis are very, very close. That's why it has to be monitored frequently. And what's imp most important is people who are on digoxin are typically on Lasix. That's why you gotta be chasing their freaking potassium all the time to make sure it doesn't get too low. Otherwise they will become digitalis toxic. Say yes, oxic. Now, digitalis not only increases the force of contraction of the heart, but it slows the conduction of the heart. So digitalis can also be used to treat tachyarrhythmias. It slows the conduction between the SA node and the AV node. Now, I know I don't have to say that because you know what the SA node and the AV node are. Ain't that right? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. You just noddingly approved, like, is this guy done with this stuff? 
Tell me you, you followed this. Now, watch. Uh, Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel. The agony and the ecstasy. People thought he had a bad back. He didn't. He had congestive heart failure. And while he was painting the Sistine Chapel, he had to lay on his back to paint it. When he laid on his back, the venous return to his heart increased and it threw him into pulmonary edema. Where you get digoxin is from the foxglove leaf. It's a plant. So he was sucking on the foxglove leaf to get the digoxin. And one of the classic signs of dig toxicity is you see yellow green halos in your vision. But while he was painting that, he thought that that was a vision from God to put yellows and greens in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, when in fact, he was digitalis toxic. Rock on with my bad self. Tell me you got that. Can I show you something just real quick? And then you can ambulate home. All right, we did good. All right? Really ambulate home this time? <laughs> <laughs> or is it going to be what? Are you guys going? <laughs> what? 14. What's 14? Orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. That's my cat's name. <laughs> I'm gonna. T I, I can explain that in two seconds. Oh, you know it? No, no, no. It's not what I was saying. She just said that you should go into this since you're right here. Oh, okay. Well, I will. Wait. Now, what was I gonna do? You don't know. Oh, son of a. It was a good one too. What was I doing? That's pretty much word for word. I got nothing. <laughs> what? You were sitting a little further back in the chair. What was I going to show you? You never said it out loud. Oh, that's a good one, too. Well, forget it now. I totally blew that. All right. Okay, watch. Watch. If you lay flat... What's going to happen to Venus return to the heart? It's going to increase. If you have left-sided heart failure, where's that blood going to ultimately back up into? The lungs. So you will get pulmonary edema. If you lay down and you can't breathe right away, that's orthopnea. If you lay down and you're breathing okay, but in the middle of the night you wake up because you feel like you're choking to death, like you can't get enough air, that's paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Now watch. If your congestive heart failure is not that bad, the left ventricle will be able to accommodate that increase in venous return. But if it continues throughout the night, your heart will begin to fail and it will start building up in the lungs. Tell me you got that. If your heart's in such bad shape that you lay down immediately and immediately go into failure, which is worse, orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea? Orthopnea, because when you lay down, you immediately go into heart failure. In paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, it takes a while for that to occur. Say yes. Boom. And that's why they sit up. Man, it was a good one, too. God. Mm. It couldn't have been that good. Oh, no. I know what it was. No, I know what it was. I'm going to save that just for me. So that when I see you, I'll know something I know you don't know. And then I will think to myself, I'm better than that. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> she just flipped me off, I swear to God. I deserve that. Did you already say that? 
Okay, you can ambulate home now. No, we have one more story. After you said stop, you have one more story. You said you had to save for the end of class. Oh, no, that's the end of end of class. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to make sure that if I tell you that story, that I'm never, like, you ain't a student in my class, no way. So that guarantees that everybody is going to get at least a C in this class. <laughs> Say yeah. Uh, What's up? No, I'm just making it up. <laughs>